Why hello you amazing beautiful people and welcome back to another random reaction video when I do these kind of random reactions I'm just gonna say that from now on it can be part of my random reaction video series if anyone wants to make a playlist of this feel free go for it and let me know um because I don't know how many of these I've done now <laughs> most of these are recommended by my good friend Judd if you don't know who he is he's a twitch streamer he's also just started his own youtube channel I'll leave a link to his youtube channel in the description if you want to go check him out and support him a lot of these recommendations come from him his community and people like you in the comments section so if you have any more recommendations simply put them down below this is america dismantles pirate nations for touching their boats the barbary wars is that how i say this again this is one of those clueless so if you don't know how the series works i just press play on these videos without knowing what they're about i go based off the titles and that is it so no clue what this is about it's uh it's by a channel called the the fat electrician um so please make sure you go support the original video and support this creator link to their video is in the description and without more talking from me Make sure you like the video, make sure you subscribe as well. And also we're gonna be live tonight on Twitch if you wanna join me for that and check out our store, gotgamesclothing.com. Links for everything's in the description. And let's jump into my first time ever reaction to America dismantles pirate nations for touching their boats, the Barbary Wars. Yes, that time the pirates kept messing with American ships. So George Washington founded the United States Navy to do something about it. Yeah, the United States Navy was founded for the sole reason of hunting pirates. <laughs> Today we're talking about the Barbary Wars. Ladies really? and gentlemen, it is pretty much an ongoing yeah. internet joke that you do not mess with America's boats. You know, because of Operation Praying Mantis, that time that America decided they were gonna sink half of Iran's Navy in like eight hours. And and Vietnam, and, and World War II, and World War I, and the Spanish-American War, and the War of 1812. Um, I guess if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you, this is the origin story of why you don't mess with America's boats. For three centuries, pirates from the Barbary states of Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli would raid merchant vessels in the Mediterranean, steal all the goods, and imprison and turn all of the crew members into slaves. So why was this allowed? I actually know a tiny bit about this. Like, 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 just a little bit. So I am curious to see where all my gaps are going to get filled here into like no, no cheeky, no cheeky statement there. Um, because I have a, like a brief knowledge of not the forming of the, the American Navy, but of how pirates affected America, um, the trading routes, the passages, the col um, like the colonization um, and all sorts back in. Um, there was a couple of really good documentaries on Netflix as well and some things I watched in the past. Um, so I have a basic knowledge. But I, I'm, I'm here to be educated by this. So let's, let's go for it. Allowed to go on for over 300 <laughs> years. Well, the only navies powerful enough to stop these pirates at the time were the Spanish, the French, and the British. And they all came to the same conclusion that it would be cheaper to pay off the pirates, giving them a yearly tribute to not raid their ships rather than go to war with them. So now those three mm -hmm. empires aren't getting their ships raided, which is fine. That's a good thing, I guess. But here's the catch with it that they may or may not have known at the time, but they definitely figured out somewhere along the way. Now now the pirates are only raiding all the smaller nations okay it's like walmart target and amazon getting together encouraging shoplifting knowing that they can shoulder the financial burden but it puts all the other mom and pop stores out of business and they become the only ones selling goods except instead of retail stores we're talking about entire nations this goes on for literally hundreds of years but america is still part of the british empire so they fall under their umbrella of protection so it's never it was also interesting because with like um the caribbean islands a lot of uh I don't know the word for it, but like lords, there's 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 more of a word for it. Of those islands had their own ships, um, and the and a lot of them, even though they were technically under rules of like the French, the Spanish, the British, um, would constantly get raided as well because it was like it was like a vassal state. So it was, but like, and they would like those nations would always be like, oh, we're being raided, but there would never be like because of how far away France, England, and Spain were, they never sent ships. It was very rare for them to send ships to help those vassal states in the Caribbean. So most of the time it's kind of like, just deal with it on your own and maybe one day we'll send some ships. Never an issue. That is until the American Revolution started on April 19th, 1775 with the shot heard around the world, the Battle of Lexington and Concord, and the famous story of a 78 year old veteran going out into his front yard and shooting three redcoats as they retreated back to Boston, sending the message for all of America that the British Empire should get off of our lawn. Fast forward 1783, America wins the Revolutionary War, officially becoming its own country 
symmetry and all of America's merchant vessels start flying the old red, white, and blue. And pretty much immediately, 1784, one of America's merchant vessels is captured by Barbary pirates from the country of Morocco. As an act of good faith for a new nation, Spain actually pays off the pirates, gets the American vessel and all of its crew back, returns it to America, and then advises the American government, hey, you guys should start paying these guys off too. That's what all the big nations are doing. At which point America's minister to France, a guy by the name of Thomas Jefferson chimes in and he's like, no, absolutely not. I'm going to go talk to him. Now, obviously I'm paraphrasing yeah, here, but basically right. Thomas Jefferson rolls up and he's like, hey, don't ever fuck with my boats ever again or else. At which point the Sultan of Morocco is like, I'm sorry, who are you? I'm Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers of America. You know, we just kicked the British out of our entire country. We're our own thing now. I'm sorry, you fucking pilgrims did what now? We beat the British in war and now we are our own country. You mean to tell me that a bunch of colonial farmers with muskets went toe to toe with the largest military on the planet that is so good at war that they can literally wear high vis red coats the entire time and still win and you beat them. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm telling you. I mean, yeah, I could probably just leave your boats alone from now on. That historically seems like it's going to be a really good idea. And that is the story of how Morocco came to be the first country to recognize America as its own sovereign nation by signing the Moroccan-American Treaty of Peace and Friendship, which is the first and longest lasting peace treaty in American history. At which oh. point Thomas Jefferson is like, oh, wow, that actually worked out. That's that's really cool. The first and longest lasting peace treaty in American history. And it was with Morocco. That is awesome. I didn't know that. That is a little bit, that is, that is a lovely little bit of information there. How cool, how cool. Perfect, I'm gonna go to the other three Barbary states and tell them the same thing now. But of course, there's gonna be a catch with that. You see, there's four Barbary states, but Morocco's the only one that's actually truly independent and the other three are just subservient branches of the Ottoman Empire. So Thomas Jefferson and John Adams go to talk to the ambassador of Tripoli and they're like, hey, can all the Ottoman Barbary states leave our boats alone? At which point the ambassador informs them, Absolutely not. You see, we're part of the Ottoman Empire. We don't need to listen to you. We're not scared of you guys. And it is our official stance that, and I quote, it was written in the Quran that all nations which had not acknowledged the prophet were sinners who it was the right and duty of the faithful to plunder and enslave. You know, unless they give us money, of course. Everything's got a price, apparently. So Thomas Jefferson is like, well, okay, we're going to war then. And that's when John Adams is like, whoa, 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 calm down. Let's just pay the tribute so that our ships can be fine. We already disbanded the Continental Navy after winning the Revolutionary War. We don't have a Navy to fight these guys. We just have to give them the money. So that's what happened. For the next eight to 10 years, America would pay tribute every year to these three remaining Barbary states. And every year they wanted more and more money. So is this guy like the... I don't know if this reaction is even gonna be fun to watch. I'm just sitting here like like lit learning. I feel like I, I should be taking notes. I mean, like a class. This is a lecture, and I'm like, yes, well, oh, nice, fucking, really? Mm -hmm. like, that's what I'm feeling. So I don't even know if the reaction is going to be great. I do apologize. <laughs> you guys are just watching me learn here. Um, but uh, I forgot what the hell I was going to say. Oh, yeah. Is he just like the historical version of the Y Files? If you don't know who the Y Files is, they're like a it's similar to this. It's, it's one guy who does these incredible videos where he goes into like, um, uh, what's the word? Conspiracy theories. It's really cool. This guy is like the historical version of him money and eventually even that wasn't enough because Algiers began attacking American vessels anyways. Okay, if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you that for the first time in American history, somebody has fucked with one of America's boats and they're not immediately sorry about it. Yet. The president at the time, George Washington, goes to Congress and pretty much tells them what's going to happen because at this point in time, George Washington is basically the king of America. Nobody actually knows if he's going to step down from presidency or not. So he's like, hey, guess what? You guys are going to pass the Naval Act of 1794, establishing the United States Navy. And at the very top Dope of the document, Navy. it very Amazing. clearly states that the purpose we are building the United States Navy is so that we can combat Algerine Corsairs, which is just a fancy word for state-funded pirates. Yes, I'm telling you that the founding document of the most powerful Navy the world has ever seen at the top specifically states the sole reason for their creation is to hunt down and destroy pirates that had the audacity to fuck with one of America's ships. We've officially entered the find out portion of the story. America immediately commissions the bill. It's kind of funny when you think that literally the entire Navy was created because they were like, hey, pirates, leave us alone. And old Jack Sparrow was like, no. And they were like, right. Build a navy, boys. Build a navy. What do you mean we can't? We're gonna build one, and then that is it. Did did did, did America literally become like one of the sole reasons for the ending of piracy in the world? Well, it hasn't ended at all. But you know what I mean. 
the ending of traditional piracy, you know? They all, ah, shiv me timbers piracy. Did it like that. Building of six enormous frigates covered in guns to go fight these pirates. Fast forward to when the frigates are 60. done, it takes a couple years. It is now 1798, and George Washington has decided to step down from power, allowing for an election to happen, and we are now into the second president of America, John Adams. And John Adams decides he would rather keep paying tribute. Disappointed! America just created the Navy, spent a million dollars creating all these frigates, and now John Adams isn't going to use them John for their intended Adams. purpose. Come on. Obviously, a lot of people are upset, including upset. his own vice president, Me. Thomas Jefferson. So I'm Thomas upset. Jefferson, the vice president at the time, immediately begins campaigning to run against the sitting president in the next election. And one of his biggest platforms is that he is going to go fight these pirates rather than pay them tribute. And his slogan for this is, and I quote, millions in defense before a cent in tribute okay just so we're clear thomas jefferson's i kind of love that millions in defense before a cent in tribute that is a badass line right that is badass we, we would rather spend all our money to stop you than give you one penny like that Thomas Jefferson, you fucking, you, you're making me patriotic and I'm British. God damn. I like that line. His platform for running for president is I'm going to spend millions of dollars in defense, which might as well be hundreds of billions of dollars at that point, because America no longer negotiates with terrorists. And I'm pretty sure my high school English teacher would refer to this as foreshadowing. So Thomas Jefferson <laughs> wins the election. The entire world finds out that he's going to be... Yeah, it's kind of interesting, <laughs> actually, when you think of it that way. Honestly, you've already built, what, 60 ships, was it? You might as well use them. The third president of the United States of America, and then on March 4th, Wait, did... the entire world finds out that he's going to be the third president of the United States of America, yeah. and then on March 4th, 1801, the day of his inauguration, he receives a letter from Yusuf Karmanali, the Pasha of Tripoli. If you don't know, Pasha is like the dictator, the king, the president, the, the main dude in charge. And at this point, Thomas Jefferson, the guy who just ran an entire president campaign on I'm gonna go fight pirates is thinking in his head like maybe this guy found out that I'm about to send a navy over there to beat him up and he's gonna send an apology maybe he wants to sign a peace treaty like Morocco did this is already working out great I might not even have to send my navy over there he opens the letter and Pasha Yusuf Karmanali has decided that he is going to poke the Pilgrim King because he is now demanding that because of the new administration, the United States owes him an extra $225,000 in tribute. And Thomas Jefferson is pissed. You're trying to get crazy with us, eh? No, I'm local. Originally, Thomas Jefferson was going to have to go to Congress, get permission to activate the Navy, to send them over there to fight these pirates, but not now. He's so mad, we're activating the rainbow shortcut to ass whooping land, nice. and Pasha <laughs> Yusuf is going to have... The fucking rainbow shortcut to ass whooping land? What even is that line? Bro, he's doing, like, rap battle lines. <laughs> That's so good. I love it. ...have some consequences immediately because he's sending the Navy today but like i said the it takes first a day of inauguration of congress to send the u.s navy Amazing. over there on a military mission so thomas jefferson is like that's fine we just won't send them on a military mission fill up one of our frigates with a bunch of gifts and peace offerings for pasha yusuf and then give it a nice healthy escort of other frigates to defend it and send them on their merry way to deliver the gifts. Right after he gives the commander of the United States Navy the standing order that he is also to defend any American citizen or ship from any potential aggression. Not aggression, potential aggression. Mm -hmm. If he thinks that somebody else might be thinking about doing something mm -hmm. aggressive. Take him out, take him down, do your... Do your stuff. So the Navy mm -hmm. sets sail. They're gone. Yeah, yeah, They're nice, in nice, route. Nice. Thomas Jefferson's sitting in his office and he comes to the realization, man, I'm pretty sure these pirates are going to attack him. But if they don't, they're actually going to end up giving Pasha what's his nuts a bunch of these gifts. And I can't have it. So he whips out the old quill and parchment. And he writes a letter back and sends that off. And that letter basically reads, hey, America's done giving you tribute for the rest of. I was about to say he needs to like he needs to somehow guarantee that they get attacked you know somehow but surely you would be a complete and utter idiot to see like this giant ass terrifying navy and be like mm, attack them and it's like well maybe no attack them maybe but yeah obviously they don't want to give him like a big ass boat full of presents when he's 
being a bit of a douche. To forever f off and obviously the letter makes it there first at which point pasha nice. goes to the american consulate building and chops down the flagpole with the american flag on it which you gotta love they sent a letter basically just saying yeah we're not paying you no more fuck you in that part of the world is how you declare war so the u.s navy shows up off the coast of the barbary states the pirates attack them because they've already declared war the u.s navy defends themselves word gets back to america congress then is like oh hey we're at war we're gonna go ahead and give Thomas Jefferson permission to use the United States Marine Corps at his discretion. And this is why to this day, the United States Marine Corps is the only branch of the US military that can be sent and deployed anywhere in the world without congressional approval. So for the next two years, oh. the US Navy and the Marine oh. Corps set up a naval blockade and just go on a pirate hunting extravaganza until October of 1803. Wait, how many, do you say two years? And just go on a congressional approval. So for the next two years, the US Navy two and the Marine years. Corps set up a naval blockade and just go on a pirate hunting hunting extravaganza until October of 1803 when the US It's kind of crazy when you think that these countries literally set up their entire premise of just raiding and plundering trading vessels and they would only not do it if people paid them crazy SS Philadelphia would get hung up on an uncharted reef right off the coast of Tripoli. The pirates seize this opportunity. They attack the USS Philadelphia, board it, take the crew hostage, and then over the next couple months, they were able to repair it enough to get it back into the harbor at Tripoli, where they then anchored it in place and used it as fixed artillery because it had way more guns than any other vessel they had. Cue our first main character, Stephen Decatur, the commander of the USS Enterprise, America's unofficial flagship. He USS decides that he's going to don his plot armor, take the... Is that why they named it that in, the, in Star Trek? I kind of like the idea of that being the reason behind the naming of it. I don't know if it is, but I'm a, you know, I'm a believe it is. I'm a believe it is. USS Enterprise out and acquire himself a pirate ship, which he does. He then takes that pirate ship and the USS Enterprise and sails both of them to Sicily, where he hires five Sicilian mercenaries that know how to speak Arabic. They then mm -hmm. sail back to Tripoli, where Decatur and 80 Marines are going to go below deck of this pirate ship, which has now been christened the USS Intrepid, as the five mercenaries are going to sail directly into the heart of the harbor, pretending to be Barbary pirates. They then go directly to the USS Philadelphia. 80 Marines and Stephen Decatur run out, kill the entire crew of pirates that are on the USS Philadelphia, and reclaim it. Unfortunately, the USS Philadelphia is too damaged to actually be used as a ship ever again, at which point Stephen Decatur decides, fine, we're just gonna burn the entire thing to the ground because if we can't have it nobody can deprive the enemy of nice things i'm pretty sure sun tzu said that so that's exactly yeah, what they yeah, do they yeah, light the did, uss yeah, yeah. philadelphia on fire they're positive it can't be put out and then they bounce not a single american is injured and stephen decatur is hailed a hero because he has now led what is in my opinion america's first special operations mission so now that that's taken care of the problem at hand is that the crew of Kinda the uss crazy. philadelphia is still being that is actually a really cool story there's like a, there was like a book i read a, a chris ryan book on the falklands war that had like a similar kind of story obviously very similar being like you know open to massive interpretation there um i love stories like that is there like a book based on like that story that story alone sounds really interesting being held hostage by the barbary pirates Wait, and the problem at hand is that the crew of the uss philadelphia is still being held oh, hostage by the barbary them. pirates and they want a ton of money in mm. exchange for them back I however america them. no longer negotiates with terrorists and that's not an option cue our next two main characters William Eaton and Presley O'Bannon. I know the ask, name, William yes, Eaton. Yes, Presley O'Bannon, as in the USS O'Bannon, the Fletcher-class destroyer from World War II that sank a Japanese submarine with potatoes. So they go in and they pitch their idea of... I'm, I'm gonna need some information on that story there. How the hell did anyone sink a submarine with potatoes? They just dropped potatoes off of the... What ha Please explain. <laughs> what the hell happened there? That, that definitely needs more, more, that, I need more, I need more, I, I, I need more. ...that sank a Japanese submarine with potatoes. So they go in and they pitch their idea of how they're going to get the crew of the USS Philadelphia back, and it is, by every definition, a special operations mission. Basically, they want to take themselves, two dudes, plus six marines for a total of eight guys, and they're going to get dropped off in Egypt, because in Egypt is Yusuf Karmali's brother that is living in exile because Yusuf kicked him out because he is technically the rightful heir of Tripoli. So they're going to get that guy and uh. all the buddies that are loyal to him, like 500 men, and then uh. they're going to march them through the desert to Derna, where they are then going to use them to fight and take over the city and exchange the city 
for the crew of the USS Philadelphia. And upon hearing this ridiculous plan, the US military leadership is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You wanna take a small contingency of men, be dropped off in a foreign country, meet up with a rebel leader who already has a bunch of men, and then convince him that you're gonna help him overthrow a current dictator, and then he can be the new dictator, and basically we're using other people to fight other people that we don't like to benefit us. And <clears throat> <laughs> Foreshadowing again? Leslie O'Bannon and Eaton are like, yeah, that's that's pretty much exactly it. And the government is like, this is a terrific idea. Mm. I mean, we're probably never, ever going to do anything like this ever again. And we're not going to have an entire branch of special forces that specializes in it. Sorry. Anyways, that's exactly what they do. They get dropped off in Egypt. No, definitely aren't some major, huge, controversial issues to come out of this decision. No. This was the only time that this ever happened branch of special forces that specializes in it sorry anyways that's exactly what they do they get <clears throat> dropped off in egypt they track down Hamet. they're like hey you want to go overthrow your brother cool grab your guys let's go somewhere along the way the marines also picked up 50 greek mercenaries as they all began marching 500 miles through the libyan desert to get back to the tripolitan coast and this march through the desert takes 50 <laughs> just, days and it is a complete they just happen to find 50 more guys and they're like yo want to fight yeah, sure. Come on in, let's go, Greek bros. Shit show, because somewhere along the way, they start running low on supplies, and they have to start rationing. And then some people get mad. There's accusations because the Greek guys are Christian, Hamet's guys are Muslims. There's fighting amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. And there's these eight Marines standing in the middle, desperately trying to keep them from killing each other as they march through the desert. So despite multiple mutiny attempts and a ton of fights, the Marines were able to keep this group together enough to make it through the Libyan desert till they arrived at the coastal city of Bamba. Once they get there- I also feel like this could have an entire story around it. All of these mini stories could have full blown freaking stories. Like just this crossing of the desert sounds really interesting. They meet up with the USS Argus that gives them a bunch of supplies so they can start eating food again. And they give enough money to pay off the Greek mercenaries. Then Eaton decides that he's gonna send a letter over to the governor of Derna right next door. Because remember, we can't attack unless they're potentially aggressive. Okay, mm -hmm. so he sends a letter and is basically like, hey, I'm gonna march my army through the middle of your town to go kill your boss on my way to Tripoli. Um, can I have some safe passage and maybe some food? The governor of Derna sends a letter back that says, my head or yours, which sounds potentially aggressive enough. So they begin making the plan for the ground attack. Hamet and- I love the- <laughs> I love the- I, I, lo I love this logic. It reminds me of um, the freaking uh, South Park. Uh, you know, like, uh, they're coming right for us. <laughs> it's like, fucking, what is it? Uh, 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 Uncle Jimbo and Ned. Like, they're, they're coming right for us. That's the sort of vibes I'm getting from this. Like, big time. It's great. Uh, it's also just getting the uh, this image of just someone just stat like, two armies looking at each other, and one army walks out and just goes, I banged your mother. It didn't work. You, your hair is stupid. Anyone got any other ideas? Your shoes are on the wrong feet. Oh, that did it. They're coming, guys. All right. They're, they clearly started this war. That's what, that's what it feels like. <laughs> or like when people, you see like two idiots get into a fight and they're just like staring at each other going, throw the first punch, bro. You throw the first punch, bro. Throw the first punch. That, it feels like that. His men are going to take the governor's palace and the Marines and the Greek mercenaries are going to take out the harbor fortress. But to do that, they're going to need a cannon from the USS Argus. So they're going to meet up with it, go get this cannon and prepare for their attack. Cut back to Stephen Decatur. While all this has been happening, there's still been a naval battle in the Mediterranean the entire time. And Stephen Decatur is on an absolute rampage because after he captured his first pirate ship, he would receive word that his brother, James Decatur, had been mortally wounded by one of the pirate ship's captains who was pretending to surrender before shooting his younger brother. Upon hearing this, Decatur immediately gives command of the new captured vessel to one of his men, leaves a couple guys with him, and takes off to track down this pirate ship that just killed his brother. So they chase down this pirate ship, they pull up right next to it, and before the crew has time to do any boarding procedures, you know, like break out the planks, tie some ropes to the other ship, all that stuff you see in the movies, nah. Stephen Decatur jumps into the enemy ship and starts killing pirates immediately. Nine Marines seeing that happen are like, oh shit, we're doing this. So they jump onto the pirate ship too and start throwing down, at which point the pirate ship veers off and breaks away from Decatur's ship. It is now nine Marines and Stephen Decatur versus over 30 pirates on this vessel and 30 is not gonna be enough. Stephen Decatur kills multiple pirates, including the captain that had slain his brother, officially avenging his brother's death, Jeez. capturing 
entering that vessel as well. But he is still absolutely furious that his brother died, and he continues to go on a rampage, capturing another pirate ship and destroying three more over the coming weeks. Cut back to the men on the ground. Eaton and O'Bannon have been getting their battle plan ready this entire Damn. time. They just Bro, had their men go badass. get a cannon off the USS Argus because they really really need this cannon if they're going to be able to pull off this mission so they're ready to attack the u.s navy gets into formation and they are going to bombard the entire city of derna while they launch this attack despite that there's over 2,000 men loyal to pasha yusuf that are going to defend it and they are heavily outnumbered so navy we'll starts bombarding the shore Hamet and his men take off to go attack the governor's palace and eaton o'bannon the marines and the greek mercenaries begin launching their attack on the harbor fortress they open up with the initial cannon fire, which is gonna be vital to be able to break through the enemy lines and establish their foothold. They fire the cannon. I feel like this dude is building up this cannon fire that's supposed to be incredibly vital to fail. I don't know, he's making a big deal about it. This cannon is so important. This cannon is everything. Without this cannon, the mission, we lost the cannon. That's what it feels like is coming. It's vital to be able to break through the enemy lines and establish their foothold. They fire the cannon. As they go to reload and fire it again, they realize that they had accidentally forgot to take the ramrod out of the cannon and shot that at the enemy too. Now the cannon's completely out and they're kind of like, oh shit, what do we do? What do we do? And Presley O'Bannon just charges into battle as the other Marines follow behind him and the Greek mercenaries behind them. They attack so quickly and so violently that they're able to overrun the entire enemy fortress before anybody really knows what's going on, and Presley O'Bannon becomes the first American ever to raise the Star-Spangled Banner over a foreign battlefield. This battle, the taking of oh. the Tripolitan coastal city of Derna, is enshrined in Marine Corps history in the Marine Corps hymn with the line from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, and it is oh, also man. where the Marine Corps would get their first nickname ever because the seven Marines present for this battle fought so hard and so violently that they simply became known as the Leathernecks, referring to the leather collar that they wore around their neck to protect it from slashes from pirate swords. So Yusuf's men end up getting beaten back and are forced to retreat to Tripoli, at which point the Marines, the Greeks, and Hamet and his men all consolidate, figure out what happened. Hamet and his men were able to take over the governor's palace, and after the taking of the city of Derna, Hamet awards his very own sword to Presley O'Bannon as a gift for how valiantly he fought in battle and this is the mameluk sword the same sword that is on the marine corps uniform today so now oh. yusuf consolidates his military sends an enormous oh, army back to derna to try to take it back over and they're kind of just sitting on the outskirts of the city waiting for the right moment to attack eaton and o'bannon are writing correspondence to the u.s military in the chain of command like hey we took this entire city with like eight marines give us some reinforcements we're gonna go take tripoli next and then we'll just overthrow this entire country this goes on for over a month and they defend the city multiple times times from attacks from Yusuf's men, and eventually Eaton receives a letter informing him that he is to stand down and just leave because American diplomat Tobias Locke has struck up a deal with Yusuf Carmanali. And apparently he struck up this deal with absolutely nobody's permission because the deal is America is gonna pay Yusuf Carmanali, the pirate king, $60,000, and in exchange, we are gonna receive the USS Philadelphia back as well as a peace treaty that they are gonna leave American ships alone from now on. So yeah, everybody's- Wait. Wait. Wait, what? So they, they get the ship back, but they burnt the ship down. Okay, that's a bit weird. We'll give you the, your burned ship back. There's no mention of the hostages, and the Americans have to pay? That is the shittest... Who wrote that? Okay, so we can take over your country. We have complete power to do it. We've already taken one of your cities, and we've held it with barely any men. We're going to take over your country. Oh, no, wait, hold on. We've changed our mind. We're going to pay you, and we want our burnt ship back. All right, we'll leave. Bye-bye. And you can have your city back. Okay, cool. High five, everybody. He's pretty pissed off about it. From Thomas Jefferson, Presley O'Bannon, William Eaton, Stephen Decatur. They're all furious that we are now giving $60,000 to this pirate king as opposed to overthrowing his entire city of Tripoli mm -hmm. or at a minimum using the fact that they're holding Derna <clears throat> and use that as leverage to exchange. But whatever, the war's over, I guess. For now. So the peace treaties were signed in 1805. Now, fast forward seven years, 1812, the War of 1812 happens. Okay, if you don't know, the War of 1812, there's more to it than this, but the reason that it started is that Great Britain wanted to have more control over the seas and trade because America was getting too much because America was no longer getting attacked by pirates because we just beat them in a war now too. So, Great Britain launches another war against America. During this war, they encouraged the Barbary pirates to start attacking American vessels 
themselves again. And honestly, it works out pretty good for the pirates, at least for a little while, because the American Navy is too busy to worry about them because their hands are full with the British Navy. Fast forward two years, eight months later, the War of 1812 ends. Now, luckily for the Barbary pirates, Thomas Jefferson is no longer president at this point. We are on to America's fourth president. Let me check my notes here. Um, James Madison. If you don't know, James Madison is one half of what is referred to as the forefathers dynamic duo. And the other half is his best friend of all time, Thomas Jefferson. And I don't know if you figured this out yet at this point in the story, but Thomas Jefferson hates pirates. So sitting president James Madison, being the homie that he is, looks over at now Commodore being, Stephen Decatur. Being the homie that he is. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson just sitting next to him, just fist bumps. Let's go fuck up some pirates, bro. And says, Go get him, tiger. He then proceeds to assemble the largest U.S. naval fleet ever at this point in time and sails directly to the Barbary Coast. He well, then immediately tracks down them. Algiers' flagship, the Mashuda. I love that you had the War of 1812. Seven years later, the war ends. And America and Britain, whatever, the war ends. And the Americans are like, We haven't forgotten about you. <laughs> They're just like, Oh, no. Oh, bro, we, we fucked up over here. Uh-oh. Takes it out, captures over 400 members of its crew and the ship itself. He then proceeds to take all of his gunboats directly to Algiers, park them in the port, and say, here's the deal. You're going to surrender, and you're never going to collect tribute from anyone ever again, or I'm going to overthrow your entire country. Obviously, they take the first option, at which point Decatur's like, okay, cool, next order of business. You're also going to pay me back for all the U.S. merchandise that you plundered during the War of 1812. And they're like, okay, here you go. They give it to him. He then proceeds to sail his fleet next door to Tunis and tell them the exact same thing, ordering them to sign a peace treaty, never raid an American vessel again, and then collects a bunch of money. He then sails them next door again to Tripoli and does the exact same thing, collects all this money, gets the peace treaties. The Barbary pirates never mess with America ever again. Decatur and his fleet sail back home and he tells the government what happened. The American government is blown away at the results that Decatur was able to achieve when asked how he managed to not only get peace treaties without too much violence, but also get a bunch of money and concessions on top of it, all Decatur said was, peace was achieved through the mouth of our cannons, at which point he was given the nickname, the Conqueror of the Barbary Pirates. And with the rest of the world seeing a new country in- Why does no one talk like that anymore, man? Everyone, everyone these days just talks, everyone's just boring. Like, imagine, like, I want more people to talk like this. Peace was achieved for the mouth of our cannon. I want, I want more people to sound like they're Arnold Schwarzenegger characters in a Predator movie. That's what I want. Him the conqueror of the Barbary pirates. And with the rest of the world seeing a new country in its infancy stand up for itself against the Barbary pirates and winning, they would start doing it too. And everybody started fighting back and quit paying tribute to the Barbary pirates. And in the coming years, they would fade into nothing as their 300 year reign of terror had come to an end. So in conclusion, the moral of the story is please for the love don't touch American boats. Of God, do not mess with America's boats. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang out. Quack bang out? That's his intro? Why? <laughs> Quack bang out? All right, fair enough. Thefatelectrician.com. Go get his merch over there if you want to support this dude. Um, whenever I do reactions to a channel, I always try and make sure if they ever plug their own stuff to plug it too. Because we literally just watched his video. Oh, so we got to show him some love. I'll leave a link to his video in the description. Make sure you go check it out. And go check out his website as well. If you want to get some of his merch. Alright, so. So. Pirates pissed off America. America decided, right, build a huge army. And then they fought back with the pirates. What is most intriguing for me and... And some information I didn't know was that the pirates were not so much just like sailing around the ocean, you know, like uh, Pirates of the Caribbean style, you know, just doing what they want. And they were more like, what's the word? An organized military organization from these multiple different countries under the Ottoman Empire raiding uh, ships and vessels more for what they would deem at that time as religious reasons. We won't talk about the money, obviously, because we don't want to get into any kind of debates around that. Um, but yeah, interesting. It would be the equivalent of any nation, the, to put it in like the simplest terms, it would be any country, let's say Ireland, one day just decides that they're going to send 100 ships 
around the world to just plunder and raid people and they then call those ships pirates when really it's they're not really pirates even though they are pirates because pirates are criminals but they're pirates to a certain nation but like doing the actions of an, of, 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 of what the other nation wants that I didn't know just makes it seem like more like I don't know the word suspicious you know like it's, it's, it's crazy that these countries that was their like what a weird thing to do to be like okay our whole point in our navy or our ships is to raid other peoples and it's like but why and it just i like, have no reason for it and no one is safe so like, that's just what we do because we believe that it is a re our, our religious right to do so seems incredibly strange you know like that whole point for 300 years was based on that crazy um but yeah and then america decided no we don't really like the idea it, it's funny it's just like it is the it is the like movie equivalent of when uh, you have a bully at a school and a new kid joins that school and the new kid is stronger than the bully, and the bully's like, "You gotta pay me your lunch money," and the new kid's like, "No," that's what it felt like, you know, in the simpler terms. America just wasn't having it, and based on America's actions and reinforcing their own navy and doing what they did, then meant that the oceans were safe for every nation. It's kind of cool when you learn about the history like this and how much it affects the future and how much it affects the future going forward. Massively so when you think that the whole point in everything we just heard was about the Barbary Wars and the dismantling of these pirates. But due to the actions and missions that unfolded in this idea resulted in future things for America. The no negotiation with, um, with terrorists. The um, like using nations to perhaps in fight or fight against other nations you know um and certain other foreshadowing elements and and uh, and special force operations and all these things that were then implemented today you know all these things that started simply because of pirates I'd like all of these ideas and choices that they made that shaped a lot of the military ideas of america in the future based on this one story you don't realize how impactful this whole story has been until you start highlighting things like that and then it becomes crazy one one story about pirates shaped so many different organizations and ideas and tactics in american military the whole future was changed because of these one actions yeah really really cool story and i really liked how the uh the fat electrician explained it he did a really good job i love stuff like this i love learning more about history history is so interesting you know is i feel like anyone who just turns a blind eye to historical events is just really missing out on some incredible stories because if you want people to remember you now, then you have to remember the past. Otherwise, why should people remember you, you know? And there's so many amazing history, uh, story, historical tales that we should all learn from. And tons, 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 tons. We're so obsessed with, like, modernized TV and science fiction, which I am too, that we sort of forget about all these amazing his historical stories. And there is a lot. And this is a really cool one. A lot of stuff I didn't know in here. Anyway, if you have any other recommendations of things you'd like me to react to and see... Put them in that comment section down below. Be sure to go support the Fat Electrician's channel. Thank you so much for watching. And if you enjoyed this reaction, please like the video and please subscribe for more as well by pressing that subscribe button. Have yourselves an amazing day. And as always, my friends, you will see me in the next video.